I'm Julie Arliss from Academy Conferences here at the University of Aberdeen with Dr. Sam Newington. And um, Sam, I'm going to ask you some questions. Is that right? Absolutely. Fire away. Fire away. Um, so it strikes me that probably, as far as we know, human beings are the only living creatures on the planet who are aware of their mortality that we are going to die. And that awareness of our own, our, our, our state, of, of, you know, that our days are numbered, that has a massive impact on art, music, culture, literature, that historically you can map that set of reflections across pretty much every discipline. Absolutely. Um, so just to come to a really basic question now. So, what do we mean by being dead? Great question. <laughs> and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, um, dying, death, and going somewhere in the hereafter, whether it's to this locale or down there or nowhere at all, which is a dispersal of atoms, has been um, a cultural concern um, for over time and place. Um, and obviously a number of thinkers and disciplines have come in and conjectured what it means right. to be dead. Right. And so if we look at, for example, um, philosophy, we've got Plato, um, who is a, a wonderful example of talking to us about immortality and notions of the soul. And for Plato, notions of the soul is abstract, it's something that leaves the body um, at the point of death, and it's that element that has immortality. Um, and so, so it's when the soul leaves the body that you're, that's how he defines death? Yes, yes, like absolutely. That, that moment of separation. I'm not sure whether it's death itself or rather in actual fact immortality of the soul, and perhaps I'm extending Plato here, yeah. actually is a further extenuation of a kind of life. Right. And so I think often um, death is seen as cessation. Mm -hmm. And so there's two points of that. There's corporeal cessation, where the body no longer functions, right. um, perhaps in the way that you know, we're talking and articulating mm -hmm. here now. Mm -hmm. But in actual fact, there's an element within us that is immortal and transgresses this part of the living. Okay, so I think there's two points there. No, absolutely. Yeah. And the, I mean, even Plato, when he talks about immortality, and I'll come back to the notion mm -hmm. of the soul in just a moment, but when he talks about immortality, he actually also refers to uh, other possibilities of what happens when we die. Um, and so in his Apology, which is a wonderful text, um, it refers to immortality of the soul on the one hand, but also acknowledgement that, or oh, perhaps when we die, we just go down there. You know, um, and so I think in his Republic, he, he kind of tackles some of this notion where there's a book called the, um, the Book of Ur, and he gives us a Baedic of the Underworld. It's a real adventure story, if you ask me, in that sense. Sorry, Plato. Um, but it is a wonderful, um, you know, kind of description, a geographical um, description um, at that point. But of course, that myth is right in, embodied within his philosoph uh, philosophical discourse. But the notion of the soul, suke, obviously, in Greek, um, has been used in a number of ways. So often we translate mm -hmm. it as soul. But you can argue, I suppose, and I think it's an article, but don't quote me on this, by Bassett, um, who refers to the soul, say, in an epic text, um, Homer, um, in his Iliad, uh, which is an 8th century BC oral poet, um, Homer. And in there, the soul almost seems like this biological entity that in actual fact the cessation of death, i.e. the corporeal self, is when the soul leaves the body and then somehow we go into the next realm, i.e. the underworld. But there is a clear separation between biological self then mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I suppose the immortality of this thing that goes right. elsewhere. But the difference between, say, Homer, I'm sure quite a few people have heard of Homer and Plato, is that um, for the um, one who dies in Homer, they go into Hades and become a flitless shade. Now, that's one type of immortality, and the only way that they can be animated is through libations. But the sense within Plato is a level of consciousness, yeah. and that is a difference. And I think this notion of the soul, or indeed concepts of the hereafter, are expressed differently by um, philosophers mm -hmm. in one mm -hmm. sense, mm -hmm. and 
now that obviously you've just touched upon um, Plato, but then when we look at Homer, which is an epic text, it's dealt with in a different way again. Um, and also if we look at other mystery, other religions, such as mystery religions, it's got this other idea that when we die and there's a cessation, that there's this notion of blessedness. We go somewhere nice, or potentially nice. Um, and so again, I, I think, you know, going back to your point about what does it mean to be dead, I think it varies depending on what um, discipline you're looking at. And it varies in terms of how we perceive what happens to us collectively as well as individually when we die and what immortality could mean. But also there's a societal response. Yeah. And that societal response can be through the expressions of rituals. And this is where a social anthropological perspective mm -hmm. can come in. And so, for example, when we die, do we acknowledge um, someone who's um, deceased as dead until we perform the funerary ritual? Because uh, the mm. body isn't just a body, is it? It's exactly not just right. a lump of stuff, it's still dad. Yes, oh, absolutely, mm. absolutely. And certainly in some cultures, it's the idea without ritual and, mm. and funerary process in a particular order or in terms yeah. of ritual performance what do you do first do you cleanse the corpse first do you adorn it do you beautify it how do you carry it out and so there's a strict process actually mm -hmm. um, and this varies depending mm. on culture dependent on religious practice but these just seem to be the overarching um, themes that kind of our living responses to what it means to be dead mm -hmm. and how we can let go of the dead but do we actually ever do the dead ever die no <laughs> they are immortal through our collective memory oh, um, okay. we will think about our loved ones who have passed mm -hmm. away wherever we think they've gone mm -hmm. you know and we may um, have a different um, belief system to say dad um, you know, Dad may think, well, he's gone down there, or once you're dead, you're dead, you're just a disperser of atoms. Whereas me may um, like the idea that they've gone somewhere nice, and they're sitting in their favourite chair, somewhere abstract on the periphery, on the edges of the world, mm -hmm. or indeed up there in the skies. And so sometimes what it means to be dead is not so much constructed by what we think of ourselves when we're dead, but how society responds to being dead right. or to the dead and I think this is so I mean a typical answer to the question yeah if, if, if we had a, a biologist or mm -hmm. a medic sitting here would be brain death is the definition of mm -hmm. death yeah do you feel that that's somehow inadequate yes I mean I think it's complex mm -hmm. um, I think the ambiguity none of us know like to be dead, what happens, <laughs> and some people talk about near-death experiences mm. going through a tunnel where they yeah. can see a light, um, you know, is that the mind playing tricks with us, or is this an actuality, um, and so yeah, I, I think we shouldn't reduce it, and I think mm. what's so exciting about what, not knowing what's going to happen mm. next is this conjecture, yeah. and that disciplines have enabled us to open up thoughts about mm -hmm. our own uh, experiences and also reflect about what it means to be alive. Right. Um, and so some people may think, if I lead a good life, I'm going to have a good death. Or then some people, you know, we see this again, and that this is why I think Homer in particular, oh, as well as Plato, he talks about notions of justice, but Homer in particular writes a trans-historical mm -hmm. text where, you know, it's talking about the human conditions. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what time and place you're at, mm -hmm. it's still a response, you know. Um, and so, you know, it talks about, you know, grief, bereavement, hereafter, near-death experiences mm -hmm. and such like. Um, and it does so in a complex way. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think culture, time, place, yeah, all complex things. things think about this. But what mm -hmm. has been interesting is this idea of, um, which we haven't touched upon yet, is reincarnation. Oh, yes. So yeah. again, you know, we've got this idea of a soul of being immortal and going mm. somewhere, but do we actually come back and, you know, as an invigorated source? Is there any evidence for that claim? Yes, I mean... Would it need evidence? Well, I mean, it's, it's something nice to think about, you know, if I could come back, what would I be? You know, I think this is sometimes what I, you know, I, I idle about. But of course we've got other philosophers, pre-Socratic philosophers mm -hmm. such as Pythagoras, 
who um, talked about um, the reincarnation of the soul and famously, right. well, this saying has been attributed to him that don't um, you know, kind of flag that because that's the soul of my past friend, you know. I think it's the um, flag in a bush. And it's this idea that we can actually our matter recollect and we become um, reincarnated. And in that sense, there's an implication of reincarnation through a corporeal presence. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And again, you know, these, this idea mm -hmm. um, of reincarnation is not only, say, in this Pythagorean mm -hmm. um, expression, but also in other religions as well. Reincarnation, of course, is, is expressed in Orphic religion, mm -hmm. as well as Christianity to some extent as well. And do you think it would make any difference to a person if they believed that there was more to life than this? Oh, I think it does, um, or certainly potentially does, um, I should say, in that, you know, there is a comfort knowing that this is just part of a process of a broader mode of existence, mm -hmm. um, and that this is just a transition, a bit like, I suppose, a caterpillar, mm -hmm. you know, if mm -hmm. I can use that. And so I think that sometimes, you know, thinking in those broader terms as life as a cyclical process, that mm -hmm. we're part of a cosmological unit here. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's something interesting mm -hmm. and reassuring potentially mm -hmm. in that. However, I haven't said that, some others may think, once you're dead, you're dead, and that's it. Thanks goodness for <laughs> that. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Because Freud would argue that it is just wish fulfillment, that yes. it's, it's, you know, being afraid of our own mortality that generates yeah. these stories. It doesn't make the stories any less interesting, but yeah. do you think it matters whether they're true or not? No, I don't think so. I think the fact that um, as thinkers, people have conjectured this possibility, and I think it has provoked us to think about, as, you know, as I mentioned earlier, well, what, what does it mean to be dead, but also what does it mean to be living? And we've made assumptions of that framework. Mm -hmm. We've made a firm assumption that if we are breathing, speaking, and consciously mm -hmm. um, kind of active, then that must be what it means to be living. Um, however, it, perhaps death is just simply a transition. Mm -hmm. um, and so, no, let's open up the box. Let's be <laughs> embracing about what happens next.